This video follows from the phase line construction in the previous video. In qualitative analysis, the goal is often to describe a reasonable narrative. A lot of that narrative relates to stability. And be careful here. It's really easy to mix with the words steady and stable. They're not the same here. So we're going to be talking about an autonomous equation with a steady state at capital P. And it turns out that not all steady states are created equal. True, when the system is exactly at a steady state, exactly, nothing changes. That's what steady means. But I can also ask what happens near a steady state. What does the system do if it starts a little bit above or a little bit below capital P? Well, three things can happen. First, it might be true that if the system starts just a little bit away from capital P, the long-term behavior is to return back to the steady state. This is called a stable steady state, or an attractor. A good mental image here is the bottom of a valley. At the very bottom, it is flat. However, if I put a ball a little bit away from the bottom, it will roll back down to the bottom towards the steady state. Small changes from the steady state don't change the system very much. It's stable. Second, it might be true that the system starts just a little bit away from capital P, then the long-term behavior is to diverge away from the steady state. This is called an unstable steady state, or a repeller. The mental image here can be the top of a hill. Exactly at the top, it can, the hill is flat, and a ball can balance perfectly. However, any little movement away and the ball will roll away from the top of the hill. The system wants to get away from the steady state. It is unstable. These kinds of steady states are often transitions, tipping points between two different kinds of behavior in a system. Finally, a mix of the two can happen. The steady state can be stable from above, but unstable from below or vice versa. And these are called partially stable steady states. You can think of this as a momentarily flat spot on the side of a hill. From one side, the ball moves towards the steady state and from the other, it rolls away. Stability is a really important concept in DEs, and I'll mention it throughout the course. In the rest of this video, I want to give a way to determine stability. Of course, stability can be determined by looking at the phase line and trajectories, but it would be nice to have a more direct method. And this method will also generalize very well later in the course. This method is called linearization. The idea here is that a linear autonomous equation is actually pretty easy to solve, it's just a percentage growth equation. So for any autonomous system, I want to ask, what is the best linear approximation to the system? And this is also a major theme in differential equations. Linear equations are in general easier and more solvable. Therefore, the investigation of many DEs goes in steps. First, I investigate the best possible linear version, and then I investigate the additional detail that the system has on top of its linear approximation. We'll see how this method plays out later in the course again. For now, let me just show you how to linearize a first order autonomous DE. Here is such a DE along with a steady state at capital P. As a steady state, the right hand is zero, F of capital P is zero. Then I'm going to define a new function, q of t. So remember that p of t is the solution to the differential equation. It's the function I actually care about. q of t is just that p of t function shifted by the number capital P. So it's the same graph, more or less the same solution I'm looking for, just shifted up or down by some number. Since it differs only by a constant, p of t and q of t have the same derivative. This means I can change the DE from asking about p asking about q. This is a kind of substitution, an integration technique that also works well for solving DEs. You'll see more of this later in the first order section. So I'll replace the derivative um, of p with derivative of q since they are equal. And then I'll replace p with q plus capital P, which is just the definition of q if I isolate it and solve for p. Well, then I have a new differential equation in the new function q of t. All right, a new equation, but how has this helped? Well, I'm going to perform another trick, which turns out to be a very common technique in the discipline. And this one seems strange, but it is a thing we will end up using more often than you would think. 
Assuming that f is analytic, which I can reasonably assume in many cases, then f has a Taylor series. Remember, f was just a function I used to describe the right side. It's not the function I'm looking for, which is now q. It's really easy to lose track of which function is which in all of this. So I can expand f in its Taylor series. I can do this with center point capital P. So I'm just going to write the first two terms of that Taylor series. Again, this looks really confusing at first glance. At least it does so to me. But it's just a Taylor series. f of capital P is the constant term of that Taylor series. And the linear term has derivative f prime of capital P and the input to the function, which is capital P plus Q minus the center point capital P. And then the dots indicate the higher order terms of the series. Two immediate adjustments can be made. First, at the start of this, capital P was defined to be a steady state. By definition, that means f of capital P is zero. So the first term disappears. And now, secondly, there is a P minus P in the linear term. So those cancel off, leaving just Q. Then as before, all the higher order terms of the series are just left unwritten. After those adjustments, the series has a pretty simple start. Then think back to Taylor polynomials. These were abbreviations of a Taylor series to a polynomial, stopping the series at a certain point, and the result is an approximation to the function. I can do this quite severely here. I can cut off the Taylor series after the linear term so that all the higher terms are gone. I still get an approximation, though it might be a pretty coarse approximation. The result is this equation. These steps probably seem pretty mysterious still, but hopefully I can argue that the result is actually a little bit more understandable. This is a linear autonomous equation. It is the best linear approximation of the original differential equation, the linear equation that best captures the original. Even the path thus far is even if the path thus far is fuzzy, hopefully this idea of the best linear version makes sense. A first order linear autonomous equation is just a percentage growth equation. F prime of capital P is a constant, Q is the function. So then this is solved by an exponential. Q equals Q naught for some starting value, and then E to the F prime of PT. The constant in the equation becomes the growth rate in the exponential, as always happens for the percentage growth equation. All right, so this is where we are. After changing from P to Q by just shifting the function, again, no other behavior changes from the function P to the function Q, the best linear equation solution to the equation is an exponential. Let me interpret this. It all depends on this derivative f prime of capital P, the derivative of the right side of the original DE evaluated at the steady state. If this number is positive, the linear approximation is exponential growth. This means that the function grows away from the steady state, indicating that the steady state is unstable. Similarly, if f prime of capital P is negative, then the function decays to zero, indicating movement back towards the steady state. And this works whether q naught is positive or negative. This is approached from both sides. Finally, if f prime of capital P is zero, then this is just the zero function and the linear approximation doesn't really say anything. The takeaway here is twofold. First, the linearization process is an important one in the theory, and we will return to it. I wanted you to get some idea of this process early in the course. Second, stability can be nicely determined by the sign of the derivative of the right side evaluated at the steady state. This is more immediate than making a phase line and analyzing it. This kind of calculation will also be useful in the future. Finally, if the derivative is zero, then nothing is learned about the system by linearization. The nonlinear parts determine the local behavior. And this is the worst case scenario. For many situations in DEs, the local behavior is really important. It would be ideal if the linear approximation could capture the local behavior, could determine the stability. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. If it does, then to figure out the local behavior requires more work, looking at the nonlinear piece. And as I said before, you should roughly parse linear as easy and nonlinear as hard. No one likes to be forced to get into the nonlinear parts of a DE, but sometimes that's where the information is, so sometimes that's where you have to look.